Well, I've been a very early user of Greenlight. I've been using it uh, since 2003. It's always been a very safe and effective technique in the short to medium term. I think we've now got to the place with the XPS system and with better understanding of patients' symptoms that we can give what is definitely a TURP equivalent operation but with dramatically lower hospital stays and particularly for the high-risk patients with much greater safety. We manage the vast majority of our patients at King's and also in the private sector uh, as day cases. And when I say day case, I'm not talking 23 hours and 59 minutes. I'm talking patients come in in the morning, have their surgery and go home in mid-afternoon. And we're very lucky that we manage to get most of our patients home without a catheter. Now, we don't have any limits for day case surgery for green light based purely on the patient didactically. Uh, so we'll manage patients with large prostates, we'll manage retentions, we'll manage patients who are ongoing anticoagulation uh, and the very el elderly as well. As long as there's adequate social support and the patient is fit to self-care after light general anaesthesia, we'll be happy to send them home the same day with very good outcomes. I think it's difficult to offer elective intermediate level surgery in large acute centres now. We have a lot of bed pressures and if we were doing TURP we would simply be cancelling a lot of patients. I think there is an economic argument to be made if one manages the patients as daycare or possibly as one night stays that one will see a cheaper outcome than TURP. It is cheaper, it's significant if one looks at a lot of patients but we're not looking at a procedure costing $5,000 versus one costing $1,000. There's a reasonable benefit to be gained there, but it's not enormous. I think, however, if we were to look at the high-risk patients, the anticoagulated, the big prostates, the very elderly, there, if we could do a proper cost analysis, we'd see a huge difference. The Goliath study showed about 70% of patients in the UK centres manage as day case. We do a lot more than that. Uh, we manage about just over 90% of our patients as genuine day cases, and that's including a very large number of high-risk patients who would be not managed as day case anywhere uh, else. And I think we can show other people that actually the higher risk you are, the safer it is not to be in hospital a lot of the time. So I think pushing towards day care is important. You've got to have a full team. If you want to do this safely in high-risk patients, you need very good expert anaesthetists, you need expert well-trained nurses, and you need the front of house team geared up to encourage the patients and support them on the telephone or with rapid access if they need it when they come home. So I think that's what gives patients the security and confidence that they will be safe when they go home and then they're very happy to be managed in daycare. A lot of people will want to see what's the flow rate after 10 years when they're evaluating these technologies. And I've never had a patient come into my office and say, Doctor, my peak flow is 9 mils per second. I want it to be 20. I can very easily make it 20 or 30 or 40. But patients don't ask for that. Patients are bothered usually by quality of life. It's only a minority of patients who have life-threatening symptoms such as recurrent UTIs or high-pressure retention. So we're, we're dealing with the quality of life issue here. And I think it's absolutely essential that the urologist offers patients a number of choices in what the quality of life means. We've been struck by the number of men who, with traditional surgery, where we're looking at 80 to 90 percent chance of a dry orgasm, uh, will just accept what their urologist tells them. And over the last six or seven years, we've been working on a number of techniques to try to preserve ejaculation. Um, we haven't published this yet, it's almost ready to be published, but we have presented at a couple of the international meetings. And by a fairly small modification to the green light procedure, we can reduce the dry orgasm rate down to less than 20%. So it's not zero, but it's a very big difference to 80 to 90%. So for younger men, preservation of ejaculatory function may be the most important thing. For the very elderly man, perhaps who's on Plavix, an 86-year-old on Plavix after a stent, not dying as a result of the operation is the most important thing. And there are other patients who say, if I'm going to have an operation, I want one operation, perhaps not sexually active, I don't care which one I have as long as I never have it done again. So we've got to ask the patients, and I think we need to do it rather better than we have in the past. All the operations give a very, very good outcome. There's no question of saying one is good, one is bad. They all do a very good job. And we need to be sensitive to those patients who are at risk of bleeding, those patients who might be at higher risk of having 
post-operative storage symptoms. We can manage them in a number of ways. Uh, we also need to be acutely sensitive to those patients who are scared of incontinence, for example, and really sensitive to men who are worried about their sexual dysfunction. And uh, we're doing a survey at this meeting where we, so far, are seeing that a significant minority of urologists don't even discuss sexual function with their patients before surgery. I think it's a shame. I think we need to do better. We admit perhaps just over 1% of our patients because there's a bit of bleeding or they're having a little bit of pain following the operation. We can almost always predict these. They're almost always very large prostates who've had catheters in for a very long time. And these patients often have bled before they come into hospital, so that's not to be surprised about. There's always some bleeding. In terms of those patients we do keep in hospital overnight, the most common group, because we're working in a relatively deprived inner city area, are those men who don't have any social support. So a man who lives on his own, and we can't send a 75-year-old out to look after himself. In fact, we can't send a 20-year-old to look after himself after general anaesthetic. It's not legally permissible. So social admissions are a majority of our care. If we had an overnight facility, 23-hour stay, we could discharge them as day cases as well, but we can't. Secondly, we have some patients who have special educational needs and often they'll be better looked after in hospital for catheter reasons, etc. And thirdly, we have patients who uh, sometimes are just very, very unfit. You know, we have some patients who have unstable cardiac problems. We'll still do them, but they'll actually go to the coronary unit afterwards for monitoring. And quite often they go from the coronary care unit to their house in the morning, which is a bit unusual. So there's no absolute rule. Age doesn't matter. 85, 90 year olds we can manage happily if they've got home support and generally speaking we think that home is better than hospital for as many of our patients as we can. It's a good operation, it stood the test of time and it does a very good job. I do think it's a harder operation to learn than many people think and I do think there are many hospitals and many surgeons who don't get the same sort of results same sort of safety outcomes, same sort of efficacy as we've shown with Goliath. Um, so one should be a little bit cautious when perhaps occasional users of TURP quote the Goliath safety data. That's not what you're going to see in the average hospital. But it does a good job. There is significant bleeding, particularly with the large prostates. Very, very few people would take on anticoagulated prostates. There is a problem with absorption of fluid, which is less of an issue with bipolar systems, but you still get fluid shifts, which could be dangerous for patients with a com compensated cardiac function. And in most centres, you're looking at two and a half, three days in hospital. Some have got it less than that, but that's, that's what it is. And I don't think spending two days in hospital, if you have to come into hospital, whether it's two days or three days, I don't think it's a big deal. Um, there's a small economic issue. Ten, ten years on, who knows if there were one night or three nights in the hospital. It doesn't matter. The difference is, can we push this treatment into daycare? as opposed to inpatient. That's, I think, where the, the crux lies. And our experience is that that's not usually possible with TURP. I think in terms of learning techniques, we're at a very exciting time. We've come from an area where it was see one, do one, teach one, to an area where we now have good simulators and good teaching programs and good mentors in almost every area of Lutz BPH surgery. Uh, my personal view is that you shouldn't be allowed to touch a patient until you've done cases in the simulator, and the green light simulator is very good. So if we have people who want to learn it, there are two groups. First of all, an established surgeon who has done a good number of TURPs in the past. Now, I'm afraid I don't think you will find green light any easier to learn than a new trainee. What will happen is if you start doing it and you get into trouble, you can switch to TURP and get yourself out of it. But our data, when we published the simulation paper, uh, the validation of the green light sim, suggests that actually it doesn't make a big difference if one's an experienced uh, resectionist or a new resectionist as to how quickly you pick up the green light. And I think the right answer here is one should do the simulated cases, one should have a mentor, and probably after you've done a few simulated cases and maybe eight, ten cases with a mentor, you'll be fine to take it on on your own with simple prostates. And then review your technique, review your complications. Make sure you're getting good at it before you take on the more challenging cases. We've had almost nobody who's done that system who's had a bad outcome. If you're a trainee, it's simple. 
go to a centre where they're doing large numbers and get trained properly according to that centre's protocols. But again, you use the simulator. You wouldn't get on a plane where the pilot had been a bit too busy to take the simulator for that jet. So why would you expect your patients to let you loose on their prostate until you've done the video game? Use the simulator.